All right, well, hello and welcome to the machine learning panel. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm from UC Berkeley. And uh, uh, I guess, first of all, welcome to the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. So um, uh, the Institute's been around since 2012 and has uh, four programs every year. They last a semester. And the machine learning program, there's, there's a program going on this semester on foundations of machine learning, and, and we're all involved in, in, in that program. Um, so the Simons Institute has these programs to bring people together to focus on a particular research topic where theoretical computer science can make a, a contribution. So it brings each, each one brings something like 40 senior scientists to Berkeley and uh, around 10 uh, more junior people, um, uh, for instance, new PhDs. Uh, and runs something like four workshops during, throughout that, that semester. So um, let me introduce the other panel members. So uh, Shai Ben-David is from University of Waterloo, uh, <coughs> Amin Kabasi, uh, Yale University, and Andreas Krauss from ETH Zurich. So the um, topic of the panel is, is machine learning. Um, and. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to start by giving you a few examples of places where machine learning has had a, a big impact on our lives already. Uh, so, you know, maybe this is all familiar to you, but uh, maybe not. So, I guess um, every time you talk to Siri and say, you know, find me a coffee shop or, you know, ask, ask for directions, uh, the system that sees that audio signal. Uh, turns it into the sequence of phonemes, the sequence of words, understands what you want and responds with appropriate uh, directions or appropriate decisions, that's, that's uh, uh, based on machine learning technology. You know, it's a, an essential part of it. And, and that sort of speech recognition technology has improved enormously in the last, in the last few years as a result of uh, uh, advances in machine learning. So another area is image understanding. Uh, so we have uh, systems now that can take a raw image and uh, from that image draw a box around objects of interest and respond with a caption like, this is two people riding on horses. Uh, or, you know, here's a bus in front of a red brick house. Uh, things of that sort. So, you know, it's really quite a, a sophisticated um, uh, example of being able to understand images and you'll see a lot more of this sort of technology um, uh, appearing in everything. Uh, in natural language processing, uh, you've probably all played with Google Translate. So again, you know, machine learning is behind uh, the success of, of this sort of automated um, translation. So here I've taken actually the abstract for the panel and put it through Google Translate from English to French to English to German to English. And you know, we get actually something that's really rather good. Uh, and that's, that's a big improvement again. So you know, translating word to word has, has been uh, uh, I solve problems all the time, but, but you know, coming out with sentences that are coherent and, and make sense, that, that reflect the context of the rest of the, of the document, um, that's actually a big improvement in the last uh, even 12 months. So September last year, Google upgraded the machine learning that they were using for uh, Google Translate, and, and that led to significant improvement in that direction. Uh, and of course, Skype, I don't know if you've played with this, but Skype has, again, um, uh, technology that will take, you know, your spoken utterances, uh, understand those, translate them into whatever other language the person at the other end is, is speaking, and, and you can carry on a conversation between languages in that way. Again, you know, machine learning is the technology behind that. Another high-profile success, uh, so this AlphaGo system, uh, about a year ago, played uh, Lee Seedol at the game of Go, so Seedol was the... Um, I think 18 times world champion uh, at, at Go, uh, and it defeated him pretty soundly. So four, four, match, four games to one in that in that match. Uh, there was a million dollar uh, prize up for for, for this. Uh, and uh, you know, again, the techniques that were used here to uh, for the AlphaGo system um, uh, were based on uh, using using training data and, and learning how to solve how to solve the problem. Okay, so, so many examples of this sort. 
So let me say just a little bit at a very high level of what um, uh, machine learning is all about and, and do that by way of this example. You know, we can think of a, uh, a machine learning system as wanting to come up with a prediction rule, let's call it, which is something that takes as input, for instance, a, uh, an image and produces an out as output an appropriate caption for that image, maybe a labeling or, or, or a description of what's in the image. And we can think of that prediction rule as something we can adjust. You know, there are, um, you know, I've drawn, shown it here as a box with a huge number of knobs, and you can think of it as, you know, somehow by changing those knobs, we're changing the mapping that we get from this image to, you know, whatever captions come out. Okay, very, very much a cartoon picture. There are no knobs. These are, you know, variables in some computer program somewhere, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, nice cartoon to imagine what's going on here and how are those knobs adjusted well on the basis of training data. So we would gather together a large collection of images labeled with an appropriate caption and use those to try to work out what's a sensible prediction rule to use in this setting. So a really key ingredient here is, is uh, training data uh, and in the cases that I showed, you know, that might take the form of a lot of audio signals and spoken utterances together with the corresponding phonemes. Right, that, that, that were spoken, or uh, labeled images of particular kinds, right? Or um, can't really read that. You know, this is the Wizard of Oz, and its translation into some language I can't. Read. Um, you know, so again, labeled labeled training data of a, a rather large scale, or uh, in the case of AlphaGo, you know, board positions from the middle of some thirty thousand, uh, thirty million, I'm sorry, Go games, right? And, and it uses that, together with perhaps some estimate of how good it is to be in this position if you're white. Okay, so, you know, the, the broad brush approach is to take this sort of, um, this sort of data and use, this, use that to adjust the knobs to come up with a prediction rule that does something sensible um, uh, in these various, various situations. Okay, so, uh, the <coughs> program that's on this semester, Foundations of Machine Learning, um, is all about you know the theory behind that technology, trying to understand you know, what are the limitations, the inherent limitations in learning problems, trying to understand how we can develop uh, machine learning systems for which we can give performance guarantees. Uh, and you know there are some areas where where theory has had a lot to contribute and, and the theory is rather well developed. Other areas where you know there are many rather fundamental things we just don't know, and, and you know there's a lot of current effort. Uh, and so we'll go through a few of those different examples. Uh, different um, aspects uh, and, and uh, discuss those in the, in the panel today. We're going to start with uh, Shai Bendavi talking about, uh, I guess, the information theoretic uh, aspects of learning theory. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, very uh, basic principles for machine learning. So, how do you uh, this one? This one? No. This one. So, uh, theory perspective, and, and I want to start, if we want to understand how machine learning works, maybe we should start with understanding how learning works in nature, how animal learning uh, works. So let me start with this kind of amazing example of success of learning. So if you ever had uh, issues with rats and you try to poison rats by uh, distributing baits around, it turns out that rats are very sophisticated. If they see a kind of a food they are not accustomed to, they will take a small, only a small taste of it. And if they feel sick within several hours later, they will etch with the sickness to this specific new uh, food that they tried, and they will never taste it again. So this is called bait shyness. They learn from one experiment. They taste a little bit of food. They go through the rest of the day. Through one experiment, they learn that this piece of food was poisoned and will never touch it again. And it's a, it's a big issue for, for farmers that want to, fi to fight rats. I mean, nowadays, uh, smart baits for rats, they have a delay mechanism. The, the, the poison gets into effect only two days later. And by then, the rats didn't feel anything and doesn't suspect that this food is poisonous. So from the point of view of machine learning, it's, it's a big riddle. How does the rat does learning so efficiently? From one experiment, it knows where to place the 
to attribute the danger and learns the lesson. It's crucial to the life of the rat, but how does it do successful learning? Maybe we can take some lessons from that when we try to uh, build machine learning. So here is another, uh, uh, so what is happening here is just a description. When they come posing food, they learn very fast. The causal relationship between the taste and the smell of the food and the sickness that follows hours later. OK, here is another example from uh, animals. And this is, uh, Skinner was uh, maybe the father of behaviorism in, in psychology, and he had this wonderful experiment, experiment in, in 1948. He took pigeons, he put them in a, in a cage, he starves them a little bit until they lose 25% of their initial body weight, and then they're very hungry. And then what happens is that at completely random intervals, they spray from the top of the cage, they spray some grain. And then there's another interval, the, the pigeon weight, and another spray of grain. What is happening to the pigeons? So the problem is, the point is that pigeons, when they are hungry, they are searching for food. So each pigeon gets involved in some activity. So some pigeon is turning right and left. Another pigeon is trying to peck at the corner of the cage. Another pigeon is trying to uh, uh, bend and, and uh, flex. And then suddenly there comes the food. So they attribute the occurrence of the food to the last activity that they've been doing. So now they will be do, doing this activity more often because it is connected with food. So the next time the food comes, they get even more reinforcement that this activity really brings food. And after experimenting with this for a day, each of the pigeons is completely obsessed with one uh, activity. One pigeon is just turning around all the time, another one is just pecking at the corner all the time, another one is just bending, and, and every, each of the pigeons believes that this is the way to bring food. <laughs> so this is called pigeon superstition, and, and you can easily see humans behaving in the same way. <laughs> and the big question for us as theoreticians is, what is the difference? What makes the rats so successful while the pigeons are doing such nonsense? <laughs> Why is learning successful in one of them? And what, what are they, in what way are the rats smarter than the pigeons? So there was this guy, uh, Garcia, here in Berkeley in uh, 1989, and he wanted to try to understand better how the rats are so successful. So what he did, is he replaced the stimulus associated with the poisonous baits by making a sound when they taste it. So now we are again feeding pigeons with the bait, but now they made the extreme effort that the bait will look exactly and smell exactly and taste exactly as the food they are accustomed to. So how are we going to warn the rats against the poison? Each time they taste a poisonous bait, we ring a bell. So now we are doing the same experiment, but the cue to the poison is a bell. So what do you think? What's your guess? Will the rats learn to avoid feeding whenever they hear the bell? Yes. 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 And the answer is no. <laughs> they fail to detect the connection between the sound and the uh, sickness. They do not refrain from eating when the same warning sound is a uh, sound again. Why, why is it happening? How can we explain it? So why aren't they paying attention to the noise? And you can ask other things. I mean, the, so then after Garcia, people repeated it with uh, electric shock, with the flash of light, with all kinds of other types of stimulus, and the rats don't learn. Why don't they learn? Why can't we have just improved rats? Maybe we should develop some kind of an improved rat <coughs> that will be sensitive to light and sound and uh, uh, electricity and whatever. What would be the problem with an improved rat like this? If the rat will start paying attention when it feeds on something, it will pay attention to what am I hearing now? What am I seeing now? What do I feel now? What's the temperature? What will happen then? Yes. Um, what would happen would probably be it'd be an overload of information and it would cause the process to move too slowly. Also, there's no proper hierarchy of information. 
If, that, that, that's all correct, but there's even worse things. Okay. If we pay attention to so many variables, then every food tasting is different than another. Right. If, you, if you pay attention, if, if you feel sick, at the end of the day you, you, you throw up, Okay, if you ate in a new restaurant that you never ate there again, you will attribute it to the restaurant. But if you start paying attention to everything, you say, oh, maybe it was the breakfast. It was, it was the first time I had breakfast at 9.01. Usually I have breakfast at 9.02. <laughs> oh, maybe it was lunch. It was the first time that during lunch there was a cloud outside. And usually when I'm having lunch, there's no clouds. So if you start paying attention to everything, then every food tasting is going to be special. We've never had such a thing before. Maybe that's why is the reason I'm feeling sick. Yes. So essentially, um, the rats would be overfitting the data. They will be overfitting the data, exactly. That's the technical word for it. Mm. So the conclusion is that we cannot have improved rats that will pay attention to any type of stimulus, because in that case, every tasting of the food will be an outlier in some respect. And there will be no way to know which tasting was responsible for the sickness. Which brings us to the point that, I don't know if I have it on my, other, my next slide or not, but the, the, the main point here is that what makes the rats so successful compared to the pigeons is that the rats are paying attention to the relevant features. The relevant feature with food, whether you'll be sick or not, is the taste and the smell of the food. And the pigeons, when they're sitting there in the cage, they don't have any clue about what is the relevant feature to the spraying of the grain. So there is a crucial issue of paying attention to relevant features. And we cannot pay attention to all the features, because then nothing in the world will be a repetition of something that we have experienced before. And this can be mathematically phrased, and this is what we call no free lunch principle. And it's not about the lunch for the rats, it's the, in the sense that there is no learning algorithm that can guarantee to be successful on all possible phenomena that can be learned. A learning algorithm must have some kind of what we call inductive bias. It is the rats learning algorithm is biased towards paying attention to taste and smell. Every learning algorithm needs to know what are the relevant features and have an inductive bias. It has to apply some kind of prior knowledge. We cannot have a universal best learner. So when you read now the stories about deep learning and how everything will be automated, and we will not need any human intervention, we can mathematically prove that this is not the case. <laughs> I mean, don't worry. I mean, we will always need some prior knowledge. The, pro provably, mathematically, we can show that there is no learner that will succeed on all tasks. If there's no student that will be at the same time the best student in math and the best violinist and the best dancer and the best uh, Don Juan with the girls and <laughs> everybody has their own areas of, of success. Yes? So like when you're developing something for machine learning, how would you prioritize uh, which variables would you Right, right. So, the, uh, uh, so what I'm saying is, is what is crucial here is applying prior knowledge. You need to know something about your problem to get started. And the prior knowledge of the rats, we can ask how did they get this prior knowledge, but this is through generations of, uh, you know, natural selection and, uh, yes. What are the implications of this mathematical, um, and these mathematical ideas on the creation of artificial generation? Right. So the, basically, the implication is that, that, that that's a very good uh, point. I mean, what I'm saying is feature selection is crucial to learn how to know the, the, the correct features. And feature selection is a big challenge for, for machine learning, and it relies on prior knowledge. And it, we can try to understand how did we collect all of this data. I mean, the, the, the rest collected it through generations of natural selection. We have a lot of uh, intuition that's based on collecting data from being babies and so on. But we are very far in terms of uh, machine learning from knowing how to collect this prior knowledge, how to uh, find relevant features without human intervention, without some kind of prior knowledge that comes from an expert. And that's what I wanted to emphasize.
All right. So, so those sort of information theoretic issues, uh, I think, you know, we can we can uh, wave as one of the success stories of uh, machine learning theory. Um, some of the other things that that uh, are, are more current focuses of um, uh, effort in that direction, in particular focuses of the of the uh, foundations of machine learning program this semester. Uh, you know, are much we have we have much less. Uh, to boast about, I guess is the, is the right summary. So I'm going to say a little bit about computational challenges in, in machine learning and, and issues of computational complexity. So again, you know, thinking of this picture where we have, uh, we, we come up with a prediction rule that takes an image and produces, let's say, an appropriate caption, uh, and we're wanting to try to learn to do that, learn to understand what are uh, uh, appropriate settings of these parameters from training data. So we can ask the question, you know, well, how much computation is required to find suitable values of those parameters? Right? How much computational effort do we need to go to? Um, so just to get a little more concrete than this uh, picture of a box with many knobs on it, let's talk about uh, deep networks that, that Shai mentioned. So these are uh, a class of prediction rules that have been very successful in many of these practical applications. Uh, so let me say, uh, at a high level, what they're doing. So for the example of taking an image and producing a caption or a label of some sort, we can think of it as successively computing uh, more complex functions of, of the image. So we start out, you know, each of these circles is uh, representing some sort of a, a computational unit. Each one has some parameters associated with it. So, you know, think, think those knobs that we can adjust to change the function of one of these, one of these units, and, and information flows through this network uh, from the image to the, the output. And, and typically what you find after uh, training this thing, after coming up with estimates of the parameters, is that each successive layer is computing something a little more complex than the last. So you know, initially for an image, the early layers might be computing things like uh, location and orientation of edges, and then combinations of such features and you know, much richer combinations of those features until at the output hopefully we're getting a sensible caption for this, for this image. <coughs> um, so actually this sort of approach using these sorts of uh, prediction rules has been very successful in practice. Over the last 10 years you know, it's led to um, many of these, these successes and in fact the ones that I described uh, earlier, all of them involved uh, deep neural nets of, of, of this kind. Um, Okay, so you know this is an empirical success, and we might ask, well, what can we say about that theoretically, right? So, uh, you know, what is uh, an effective approach to finding good values of the parameters in such a network, let's say, uh, to fit training data, so that we perform well, you know, given the images in our training training set that we come up with sensible captions for those those images. Um, how might we do that? Well, if you step back and think about it, you know, we have a bunch of knobs to adjust. We could think about trying all values, right? Try every setting of the knobs. We, maybe, maybe they have 10, 10 values. We try the first one. There are 10 different locations. The second one, for each of those 10, we have 10 different values to try, right? That's for each combination of those. There are 100 of those. We try 10 different values of the third one and so on. Okay, so it doesn't sound like such a great approach, right? And it, it's not a great approach because this number grows exponentially with the number of parameters. Right, so you know that's that's very bad news. Right, it's not as if we need bigger and bigger computers to solve this exponential growth. Right, exponential growth is is kind of fatal. And you know, there's this really nice story about the uh, uh, Indian king that was so thrilled with the invention of the game of chess that he offered the inventor, you know, uh, whatever he wished for within reason, of course. And the inventor said, fine, you know, give me just just some rice, one grain for the first first uh, square on the chessboard. And then double it on each square, you know, two on the second, four on the third. <laughs> and the king thought this was fine until you, you know, actually go and calculate what happens when things double, you get to very large numbers. And somebody did the calculation that, you know, on the 64th square, if you could grow 10 grains of rice for each square inch, then, you know, to, to provide the rice you need for that square, you'd have to cover the surface of the earth with rice paddies, uh, including the oceans. <laughs> um, Okay, so exponential growth is, is, is terrible. You know, this is not going to work. I guess the bad news is that um, in, in some sense, you know, in the level of generality that I've, that I've described it, 
we can't prove that there's any better approach. <coughs> right? So, you know, this, this is pretty terrible. Um, so what's used in practice, actually, is something much simpler. Uh, I'll call them local greedy updates. The buzzword is stochastic gradient descent. Um, and, and how this works is you take a single training example, a single image in the caption that, that is associated with that image. You provide that to this, to this um, system, and then you go and tweak the parameters. Wherever the knobs are, you can work out pretty easily, you know, fix all the others and, and think of just one of these knobs. Should I be adjusting it up or down? Which is better in, in terms of the caption that I'd like to produce? Uh, and you go do that for all the knobs. Just adjust them all a very, very small amount. Then throw that example out, move on to the next one, keep going like that. Okay, very simple-minded thing. Um, it turns out this is really hugely successful in practice. And again, you know, um, uh, we don't really know why. I think it's fair to say um, we don't really know why. There, there are some results. You know, there's progress. In this situation, we can, we can prove something. You know, we can get, get some sort of performance guarantee. But that set of situations is, you know, um, rather deficient. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of work in expanding the boundary of what we can uh, prove results about for this sort of this sort of approach, but you know, it's certainly a very um, active, ongoing research area to understand you know, what are the limitations of these kinds of approaches, what sort of guarantees we can give. Right, so these are some of the topics that we're focused on. This is an example of one of the topics we're focused on for the Foundations of Machine Learning program this semester. Um, uh, one other one is uh, interactive learning, and Andreas is going to tell us about that, and, and some issues of safety in uh, machine learning. So uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Science Institute for hosting me this uh, term in this fantastic machine learning program. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, one of the themes that Peter mentioned, namely interactive machine learning and some emergent issues related to safety when using uh, machine learning. So the picture that came up several times now of what uh, machine learning is in practice most of the time is that we start with a large data set, maybe images labeled as cats or dogs or labeled with captions, etc. And then our goal is to uh, learn a prediction rule which we can use to attach a label to some image we haven't seen yet. So we separate training, and then once we have to train uh, the model trained, we apply it to make predictions on new examples. But in a lot of applications, you might want to think about learning systems that learn while they're interacting with the environment. Maybe the most prominent example of this that most of you will be familiar with are recommender systems, right? Those systems that recommend which movie you might want to watch, which product you should buy online, uh, maybe which posts you should read on your friend's time, uh, feeds on Facebook, etc. right? And the way that these systems work is they observe how we interact with them, right? So to interact with the content that they show to us. So for example, um, how do we like the movie that they recommended to us? Or did we buy the product they recommended us? Or did we click on the feed that they showed? Okay? And so, essentially, the decisions that these learning systems make affect the very data that these systems learn on. Right? So there's not a single set that's given ahead of time, but the system interactively, by interacting with its environment, uh, learns something. Right? That's a very important paradigm. Many other applications of this. And uh, one of the abstractions and models uh, that lets us reason about uh, these notions already came up in, uh, in uh, Shai's talk uh, is called reinforcement learning. And so here, we think about an agent, maybe a recommender system, that interacts with uh, the environment by carrying out some actions, maybe recommending a movie to watch. And then that might affect uh, the state uh, of the environment and also affect the reward you get, right? Whether, uh, for example, uh, we actually like the movie that was recommended to us. Okay? And that leads uh, to a crucial challenge uh, called the exploration exploitation dilemma, whereas the system needs to figure out um, how should I show examples to learn more about how the world works uh, whereas, how can I use what I've learned about how the world works in order to make good decisions, right? Do I maybe show a movie to figure out your preferences, or do I take my best guess of your preferences to show a movie that you like, right? And this uh, dilemma is very familiar to all of us, right? If you decide to go which restaurant to go to, you can choose to go to a new place, or maybe go to the, our favorite restaurant around. Okay, and so uh, now reinforcement learning has been around uh, for, uh, for uh, many years now, uh, but there's been striding uh, successes in the recent years. So one was already mentioned by Peter in this talk, uh, this AlphaGo uh, reinforcement learning agent. I'm curious how reinforcement learning is simply different from case-based reasoning or exactly based reasoning. Okay, can you maybe take that question uh, later? Okay, so um, 
So here we really uh, interact through the environment to get feedback. Okay. So uh, there's many other examples, right? So for example, there's general purpose reinforcement learning agents that learn to play Atari games at superhuman level. Or earlier this year, there was an announcement that a reinforcement learning agent uh, is able to play uh, No Limit Texas Hold'em poker at super level. Okay, so lots of these really tough challenges that the community has been working on for many, many years have been falling over the last couple of years. So this is really a remarkable uh, progress. So now, with all this excitement, there's temptations to use these systems, right, for more and more complex and high-stakes applications. Maybe use them to learn to drive our cars, right, or to control our power systems in order to make them more energy efficient. Right? Or maybe even recommending treatments for patients in order to improve the outcomes. Right? Uh, now, um, if you think about training a computer, uh, a reinforcement learning agent to play a game, that's a very easy thing to do because you can play lots and lots of simulations right, where um, uh, reinforcement learning agents essentially compete against each other, experiment with different moves, etc., to try to uh, improve with their strategies. But if you think about uh, employing these systems in the real world, then essentially exploration, collecting data, means you have to try something you haven't tried before, right? And that potentially can be really dangerous, right? You really should be thinking about safety uh, in, these, uh, in these sort of issues. Right? There's lots of interesting challenges and important research challenges um, on how to rigorously reason about reliability, security, safety, etc. of machine learning. So I'd like to talk about one uh, such setting here in the context of robotics. Um, so that's a paradigm where reinforcement learning has been uh, hugely successful, right? Where you might want to, for example, learn how to adapt control strategies for complex robotic systems. And uh, that is a very difficult task. So there's been leaps and bounds in progress over the recent years, but it's still a very tough uh, problem. So here's a video that shows some outtakes out of the uh, robotic challenge. and uh, do arbitrary exploration. Right? The question is how do you rigorously mm. reason about the constant consequences of actions that you've never tried before, but you need to try them in order to collect data. Right? And that's a great avenue for theory. And so one model that's been explored is basically trying to essentially optimize some unknown reward function. So for example, optimizing the performance of a robot at some task as a function of, say, the control parameters that you plug in. But at the same time, you don't know ahead of time whether any of these actions is safe. So one way to model this is to have some sort of constraints that you require, right, that the actions that you try is actually safe. But if you don't know ahead of time what is safe, you sort of need to figure out, right? You need to be cautious uh, when exploring, right? And the question is how do you rigorously reason about this, right? You want to be able to essentially learn to improve at some task while at the same time figuring out what is safe or not, right? And this is a very difficult problem. In general, there's no free lunch, right? As I was mentioning in this talk before. And so it's very interesting to try and understand under what sort of circumstances can we actually make rigorous assertions about uh, safety of these systems. And under some sort of assumptions, that's actually possible. So it's possible to prove, uh, say, with high probability that the system is never going to take an unsafe action um, uh, while at the same time converging to a good solution uh, if you have enough uh, assumptions, say, about smoothness of the system. So here's a little demonstration of this uh, on a very simple uh, control task. You have this quadcopter here that starts uh, from an initial position, flies to a target position. So it's a very simple task, right? But what the robot now does, it, it starts with a very poor initial controller and autonomously decides how to experiment, tweak its knobs, right? Tweak its own parameters in order to try to get better at that task. But at the same time, there's lots of parameter settings that will immediately crash the robot against the, uh, against the wall. Okay? So you have to very cautiously explore, figure out what is actually feasible, and while exploring that feasible region, try to optimize its own performance. Okay? And so this will just run for a couple more experiments, uh, 30 or so in total, and then I'll show you the comparison of those uh, to result in control. So this is, I mean, arguably, I mean, a very simple task, right? But it's sort of a demonstration of the kind of questions you might be interested uh, in exploring. Okay, so uh, that's basically it. Uh, so uh, now that uh, to conclude, as we uh, want to make use of the power of machine learning in real world applications with higher and higher stakes, it's not about just optimizing accuracy anymore, right? You have to really rigorously thinking about constraints imposed on these systems related to safety, reliability, but other issues like interpretability, privacy, and one of the other notions will be featured in Amin's talk uh, at the end of this uh, sequence of presentations uh, related to fairness. Uh, so uh, that's it, and I hand over to you.
So I'd like also uh, to thank the, uh, the organizers uh, for this uh, amazing program this semester at uh, Berkeley. It was a, a very good pleasure to be here, uh, especially if you're, you're coming from East Coast. <laughs> and, you know, the weather was much better here. So um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some aspects of machine learning in the um, uh, network science and uh, and fairness and uh, basically well, why do we uh, you know one of the reasons that we care about uh, network science is that you know a lot of data that we collect are actually from networks and um, so for instance uh, you know Google uh, this is uh, 60 seconds right only 60 seconds Google uh, receiving 4 million search requests for uh, Facebook um, you know there are, uh, people sharing 2 million more than 2 million uh, pieces of information over 60 seconds, and some of you are contributing to this number right now. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, they're uh, you know, uh, pretty much the same number. If you know, 60, if you're uploading uh, 72 hours of video every 60 seconds, so this is an explosion of uh, data uh, through these uh, you know networks. Um, and uh, so, no, uh, very often we actually know the, uh, the structure of such networks. Uh, for instance, you know, at least Facebook, Facebook and Twitter, they know you know how the network look like, who is uh, friends with whom, who is following whom. Uh, for computer networks, we also knew uh, pretty much, at least locally, you know, what computers are connected to each other, what computers are connected to the routers. Um, to give you another example, you know, in for transportation network, we also know, you know, which stations are connected to each other, and these are basically public knowledge. Um, but very often, it also happens that we know that the network exists, but we don't know, uh, you know, the structure of the network. And I'm going to talk about uh, two particular problems today. Uh, one is about the social ties in a hard-to-reach population. These are two uh, uh, projects that have been heavily involved in the last uh, couple of years. And the other one is uh, the functional connectivity in the um, uh, So I'm going to uh, just explain a little bit what uh, this problem means and, uh, and then, uh, you know, what uh, we could do about it. Um, so, um, the first one is, you know, this hard to reach population or seeing the unseen network. And um, it basically relies on, you know, hard and um, easy questions. So, um, uh, if I go on the street and uh, randomly ask people, you know, to which of these candidates they voted, probably not for this election, but for the previous one, people were willing to give the answer. <laughs> and uh, so this is, you know, we don't, it's a free country, uh, so um, if you have an opinion, you can just uh, say, right? Um, so this is, uh, let's say that this is an easy question, but uh, what is a hard question if I, you know, go out and ask someone, are you a drug user? Uh, if you are, you're not willing to, you know, give me the answer. If you're not, you take offense. Right, so, yeah, and if I insist, I might actually get a punch on the face. <laughs> uh, so these are hard questions, but um, um, so if we want to understand, for instance, uh, the, uh, the population of, uh, you know, drug users, how they interact with each other, who is friendly, with them, or, uh, you know, people who have HIV positives, or, you know, uh, actually homosexual, uh, homosexuals in some uh, certain countries that um, if they reveal their um, uh, their uh, sexual orientation, they might actually face uh, a severe punishment. Uh, these are called uh, in uh, public health community. These are called hard to reach population because you, can, you know they do not allow outsiders to get in um, to uh, to get information. It's very difficult for these uh, uh, public health organization to get any kind of information about. Them. So random sampling. This is you know how we collect data basically. Is not going to work, and we have to come up with other methods. And uh, over the last couple of years, uh, very interesting methods came up, and uh, right now many of these whole health, health organizations are actually using uh, a very different kind of sampling methods. Not random, something that incentivizes people to give information. So what do they do? They say that this is a community, this is a population, um, and what they try to do is that they find one person, let's say at a bar, the drug user, and give him money to come to, uh, to the server, ask him questions, test him, right? And then they give him a couple of coupons and tell him that if you go and distribute these coupons to your friends who are drug users, and they come to the study, you all get money. So the guy is very incentivized, 
right, to go and uh, distribute these coupons, they get money for food or other things. And um, so this is basically, that is the first note, they call it the anchor note, he gives it to another friend, this friend gives it to another one, and they come to the study, we, you know, we can test them. And this is what we actually do now at Yale. Um, so for, uh, for instance, uh, we, we are trying to actually understand the, uh, the network of uh, drug users in Hartford. It's a city uh, close to me. Now, this is also a distorted version of reality because this way you only get drug users. You don't get other people. There is no incentives to get other, you know, um, um, usual people, right? And at, this is one of the problems. The other problem is that um, um, we don't have, you know, a lot of money to explore completely this network, right? So we, the minimum number of um, these samples, we want to understand how people interact with each other. And this is uh, what we have been involved in, the, uh, uh, in uh, you know, machine learning tools. Uh, help us actually to understand with uh, this completely biased sample, well, you know, uh, one thing that Shai talked about, how we can actually reason about, you know, who is connected with whom, and then this is going to be important information because let's say that someone is connected to everyone, probably that is a distribution of the drug. Right. Um, and then we tested, uh, so there are some uh, anonymized, uh, actually, uh, populations, so these are the drug users in St. Petersburg, um, the, vector, the network is, uh, is known, it is anonymized, but uh, you know, how the structure is known, and then we test it on uh, you know, this kind of data, and now we're testing on, uh, on real data that we collect at, uh, at uh, Connecticut. So this is uh, one sort of uh, network. Uh, the, the other one is, uh, 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 you know, can we use uh, machines to use brains? And, um, and that has been another project that uh, I'm uh, a bit uh, a student of mine and uh, a few neuroscientists at Yale. We are trying to, you know, uh, to tackle this problem. <laughs> so what do what do we do? Uh, there are these uh, big scanners. They put uh, people in them, and uh, you know, these are called fMRI machines. And uh, and the image that you get is basically there are going to be uh, small cells. They call them voxels, around one million of them. And then the, these scanners, you get the uh, uh, time series, like you know, over let's say a few minutes the oxygen level on these uh, very small cubics. So this huge amount of data. And, um, and when they put people in these scanners, they ask them to do a specific task, like reading, or listening, or thinking, or do nothing. Right? Um, and what we are trying to do is that, you know, can we actually just look at this? Can we, can we say what they're doing? Right? Without knowing. Um, so, uh, this is, um, so, and the way that we are trying to do is to uh, make, so this is going to be, a, this is a, an ocean of data. So if you look at this data, two individuals are completely different from each other. We cannot actually distinguish, we cannot say anything if we look at this huge amount of data. So instead, what we are going to do is that to um, try to compress the data, to find, you know, important information, and then make a network out of this, uh, um, you know, huge data. So basically, we, uh, these, these are you know, numbers are given by neuroscientists because these are meaningful, biologically uh, meaningful things. So we make a small network of 30, of 30 nodes and then you know, um, uh, make edges. Uh, basically, these nodes represent different parts of the brain and their functionality and then how they uh, correlate with other parts of the brain and uh, whether they influence each other or not. And once we do that, then uh, you know, based off the, so these are going to be you know, different kinds of networks uh, for different subjects, for different people, and for different tasks. And the tasks were basically nine tasks, like language, motor, gambling, et cetera. And what was very interesting was that we could actually predict what they were doing with a very high accuracy. So that is the, uh, 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 that is a chance if, you know, by chance it is just one of these nine tasks. And then, uh, you know, basically 80, 90% of the time you could actually say, this is a task that this person is. I understand this is a very coarse level of understanding, of reading the brain, but, um, uh, this is just uh, you know, the start. Uh, so that was uh, the two projects that I wanted to talk about and, uh, that we have been involved. And the last one, so you know, um, this touches on people's life. Uh, the last one was about you know, uh, we hear a lot about these things. You know, can algorithms be uh, racist? And you know, what should we do about it? Uh, this is the pictures that I actually I have a ten-month uh, old daughter. And last night, at midnight, I searched for babies. And these are the pictures that I got. 
these are there on Google. And what is wrong in this picture? Uh, they are cute. They are very cute babies. Right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Uh, they're mostly white. You have to go really down into the search to actually get any uh, uh, dark skin baby. So uh, you might say that, well, you know, these are cute babies. It's fine. I mean, it's a search. But the problem is that you know a lot of these machine learning algorithms are based on collecting data just like this. So if you see only white people, you're only going to learn about white people. So this is a very famous example. Joe was actually a student at MIT or postdoc. And uh, this actually became a story at BBC. So what the problem was that the computer could recognize the white mask, but couldn't recognize her face. The algorithm was not designed to be racist, but because it has never seen dark faces, it, could have, it didn't learn about it. Okay. And then, um, so there was this um, AI beauty contest last year. Uh, a lot of people submitted uh, you know, their pictures, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and then there was this AI uh, judge program behind it to select you know, the winners. There were 45 winners. Only one of them had dark uh, skin. <coughs> All 43 of uh, the rest were actually you know, they were white. So if there are prize associated with them, you have a very low chance if you, uh, you know, your skin is not white. Um, and then, uh, you know, another thing is, uh, another example is the Amazon Prime. So uh, um, last year, again, uh, uh, people figured out that uh, Amazon uh, excluded uh, some neighborhoods in, uh, you know, six cities that had uh, minorities uh, for the uh, um, uh, free same-day delivery service. And then when they ask Amazon, you know, why are you uh, racist? They say, well, we didn't do anything. This is the algorithm decided. And the algorithm decided because it uh, predicted that we are not going to make any money in those neighborhoods. Okay, so by it's not that someone maliciously uh, is behind these algorithms to make them, uh, you know, to make them racist, but somehow through the data they pick up on features that uh, uh, probably they should. Right? And this is uh, you know this brings us to this um, idea of the furnace. If you know, you go to a bank uh, for your loan, and then someone, uh, you know, based on the skin of your color, the, the color of your skin, they, you know, they say, okay, your, you know, your rate is going to be much higher. That's not okay. Right? If the algorithm decides based on that feature, so one way or another, we have to um, um, uh, correct these algorithms uh, and, uh, you know, make the bias uh, uh, regarding these um, uh, protected features uh, lower. And uh, so that was, you know, the, one of the things that uh, we discussed here in this uh, program. Uh, it, it's, it's a real challenge. You know, there are not very good solutions out there. And um, but we hope that you know, through uh, discussion, we can actually find something that you know, at the same time, the algorithms can work well, but the uh, the protective features are uh, are not going to be a part of this. Thank you. So uh, let's open up for questions. I guess we maybe should go back to this question about yeah, RL versus. Right, so these are orthogonal, uh, orthogonal questions. I appreciate it, but then in that orthogonal, could you have your uh, uncertain functions to specify uh, the kind of 
auto-generated in the form of use cases that the system could learn. I mean, my, my background is not learning, so it's kind of, I, mean, I see some interesting synergies there. Aha, but it's um, to be seen as sure. So again, these are orthogonal issues, right? So uh, there's no reason why insights in certain applications where case-based reasoning has been applied shouldn't find a way into a systems. Uh, so, but it's refreshing to see some talk on AI for a long time. Just I mean, if you had a few seconds, I, I'm, it's a very good talk, and I, I one question on your AI and racism. There is also, yeah, what I would say, yeah, other side of example that uh, you have not shown, where you said the dark faces were not recognized, and this actually came in the news. A yeah, Google face recogni recognizing algorithm took some African American faces, and it actually classified it as gorilla. Yeah. I think it actually came in the new brand. So my point going to it saying is, uh, this may actually point to, yes, the algorithms don't know. They, they are not human, so they don't know white, black, brown, etc. But what I would like to say is that this simply means the feature extraction technology has not advanced to the point where it's optimal. And again, I think one of the person mentioned, it's also an exponential problem. But I think that may point to the cost, but I mean, I don't know. But it, it's also, that's one thing. And the second thing is the number of uh, training patterns that were then used could be, could be predominantly white. And uh, in those patterns, even if it's as a mix of black, the lack of feature extraction from the later case could just make them into the false positives, causing them to, uh, again, I don't know. Yeah, that is correct. And they, they actually try to correct, you know, uh, uh, so. As you said, it was in, on the news, and uh, and right the day after, they uh, um, you know they tweaked the algorithm in order to make sure that this is not going to happen, right? Um, but it was very manual, right? Um, this is one issue. The other thing is that you know it's not only one feature, one you know it's not only the uh, skin of the color. The color of the skin is going to be um, <coughs> you know the feature that you have to protect. There are other features that can imply. Yes, feature vector. Yes. I right. Agree. So. Um, and uh, we don't know of any uh, uh, rigorous way of uh, attacking this problem, at least for now. All the, uh, all the solutions are just hand tweaked. So there's actually a more subtle issue at play there as well, right? So if you think about the, the Amazon example, it may have been totally correct that in those neighborhoods, it's, you know, go, it, the, the prediction of having uh, less profit is accurate, right? And if it made that prediction based on you know, the proportion of people of one race versus another, it might still be accurate. Yes. yes. But it's inappropriate for the decision to be made on that sort of a basis. Yeah, from a social perspective. <laughs> so it's not just a question of optimality. Yeah, media <laughs> will they are of it, but from an algorithmic perspective, it's, not, it's probably optimizing a cost function and say, here my costs are low or even negative, and it goes up. Yeah. Right, I, I that's right. It's optimizing the wrong no, thing. No, no, it's, it's, it's exactly. Right. Yes, another question. Uh, Thank you very much, I mean, for like being so socially conscious about the bias algorithms, right? But however, in his first part of the presentation, all of these groups that you mentioned have been prosecuted at one point or another. So your efforts into probing the internal structure of those prosecuted groups is deeply disturbing. Those techniques can be used today for that particular purpose, tomorrow for some other purpose. Should not we be more careful before creating algorithms that can be used for unintended? That's actually a very, very good point. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention actually at the presentation um, is that um, this data, when we get actually the, the data, is heavily anonymized. So, uh, so there individuals are, there are different methods of getting right, data. Right. So the in, 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 um, individuals cannot be ide uh, identified. That doesn't matter. Right? The end goal is to expose those groups, figure out how they work, how they function, who those people are, find them, and prosecute them. Like, try being a gay in 1950s Britain, and you were persecuted. And you know very well examples of very famous scientists. So again, although you're very conscious about the outcome of these algorithms and their impact, in the previous part of your work, I think it is. You know, I agree that you know, there, very, very there are going to be issues like uh, you know if um, these uh, uh, communities should be protected. Uh, so the main purpose of our work was, was for the health, right? So we wanted to provide um, better health uh, for, for for those people. But uh, I agree that uh, we have to be conscious about you know what, what we're doing and uh, uh, and again there is uh, you know it's. Uh, 
So here is the thing. Um, um, you can have a knife, and there are many ways to use it. Right? Um, In this particular case, it's very clear. That's what I'm not all right, maybe one more question. Yeah, I was, I was uh, in your classes, do you use any cloud online machine learning platforms like Azure Machine Learning or anything like that? Is it, is it suitable for this? Sorry, if you're asking me. Well, uh, any, anybody, I mean, the, like Microsoft has, has Azure m Machine right. Learning. I was wondering if it's suitable for use with a class like this. We certainly do. Yeah. yeah. Um, when the data is big, uh, on a simple, on a small computer, you cannot actually do anything. Right. It's, uh, it's so right in the cloud. Yeah, you basically um, try actually to run things on the cloud, and uh, it, it's not that, it's very cheap and easy. All right, so it's 11 o'clock, and I know people have to go to other things. If you'd like to hang around and ask other questions, you're welcome to do that. So I think we should probably stop here and next